A very good afternoon to you all. Thank you for joining us for this next webinar in our Virtual Leadership Summit series. Uh, the um, topic for this afternoon's webinar is Leadership in the Global Context, where we'll also be considering the idea of servant leadership. My name's Andrew McDowell, uh, and um, this is a picture of me here. And um, I'm very pleased to be presenting uh, this webinar with you this afternoon, which will go for 35 minutes or so. So just before we get started, as many of you have been involved in um, TPC's online learning sessions before, just before we get started, we'd like to make sure everyone's ready for the time and uh, can get best use of, out of the time that they've invested. So just to ask yourself a few questions about how present you are for today's session and what you need to do to get the most out of the session. And I wonder what also needs to happen to tell you that this session's been a useful investment of your time and how you'll know that. So we really encourage you to just turn off all the uh, potential distractions uh, and uh, the email and the, uh, the telephones and that sort of thing, just to really focus in on this time uh, to be able to get the most out of our time we've got together. Uh, as it's a, um, a, a webinar which won't have much opportunity for real-time interaction, we invite you to have a pen and paper handy just so you're ready to be able to take some notes. There will be some times during the session where I'm going to be asking you some questions and hopefully that will be a useful opportunity for you to be reflective around your experience around these topics. Okay, so as we mentioned before, uh, the, the, the concept we're going to be exploring this afternoon is around uh, how leadership can be explored at a broader level, maybe even at the global level. Uh, this comes from my personal interest in leadership uh, over the last 20 years, and as I'll explain in a moment, my involvement with working internationally with uh, emerging leaders around the globe. So we're going to be looking at some of the challenges that we face globally um, and what leaders will grapple with, and also consider the concept of servant leadership as a model for how leaders might consider how they can have an impact in their own communities uh, and serve those people around them. Uh, it's not the only model of leadership that's out there, uh, but it is something which is useful to consider in relation to how we might look at more of a global perspective. As I, I said, that um, this topic brings together two of my uh, great loves and interests um, for the last uh, 20 years, those of you who, who know me, uh, will know that I've been involved with a, a, an NGO, a non-government organization, which is United Nations uh, linked, called WISE International, which, is, which focuses on identifying emerging leaders from around the planet uh, and supporting them in their leadership development. The WISE has been a partner uh, for TPC for the last six or seven years, I'd say, and we've been working together to collaboratively uh, supply volunteers and coaches uh, and various financial support for the charity. Um, it's a UK registered charity running since 1989 with the mission really to support emerging leaders for global change its vision is to bring together real change makers in different um, communities around the world. And over the last um, 20 years, we've worked and conducted programs in 15 countries with over 1,000 emerging leaders from 115 different nationalities uh, and countries. As I mentioned before, it's associated with the DPI, or the Department of Public Information of the United Nations. Uh, and really, its main work is around the development of something that's called international leadership programs. Uh, the reason that I'm giving you this level of detail about this organization is it's very much formed the thinking for me around leadership from the global perspective. The way this program works uh, is it has a, a, a global reach in, into people from, well, as I mentioned, 115 countries. And there are many, many applicants, uh, many emerging leaders who would like to be part of this program. They're either identified by peers or NGO partners or different international organizations. Uh, and 
they come together for a 12-day international learning community, which generally involves 30 people from about 20 different countries and staffed entirely by leadership professionals and volunteers from different parts of the world. And then it's followed up uh, by a coaching program, uh, which really supports the people who participate in the program to uh, be involved in a, um, a process of coaching which supports them to embed their learning and put their projects into action. The approach that's used and the reason why this is relevant to the current conversation uh, is very much around the idea that really leadership begins with the self and we've found that in this context uh, because we're working transculturally uh, uh, with people from many different backgrounds, religions and uh, different uh, cultural belief systems, educational levels, um, the place to start is leading yourself. And we see leadership as a, an expression of people's willingness to engage in the issues and challenges that they see around them. And it's about finding creative solutions to the local and global problems which we're facing and I've been absolutely inspired by the various people that I've worked with over the years from, uh, from this work with WISE and it's really helped me understand how a global view really requires us to, to hold a more global context and as the world becomes certainly much more globally orientated, uh, our leaders and in fact all of us uh, will do well to have an appreciation of the global context. So we thought it would provide a little bit of insight to where we are at the moment uh, from a global point of view. So this is very much our context. Now we know more than ever before that what happens in one part of the world really does affect what happens in other parts. We know that there's an impact uh, when something happens in one part of the world. Our interests extend much more beyond the national uh, and local boundaries that they used to uh, extend across. And in that sense, we are experiencing a level of awareness uh, around the world where uh, leaders need to also adopt this awareness and have an understanding of really where we're at. It's interesting to think that we are in a, a very changing world, and of course we're always in a changing world, uh, but this time in particular, we are living uh, in times of massive change and increasing complexity uh, and in fact this does offer us many challenges from a leadership point of view. If we look at the world, we look at the globe, we look at the people on the planet, our seven billion now, uh, it's really interesting to know that we're actually getting younger. As a, while there is an aging population in some ways, um, that's primarily in the West and the largest ever generation of young people uh, is now entering the transition from adulthood, uh, childhood to adulthood. So we're getting more young people on the planet and we know that this is distributed unequally. So just under half the world's population is now under the age of 24, which as I said is the first time that's happened. Uh, and 86% of 10 to 24 year olds, so the youth, so to speak, are living and residing in what uh, various international organisations like the UN call less developed countries. So in the global south, effectively. So you can see on this map the darker coloured reds on the map indicate where um, the youth is really concentrated. And you can see the youth is very much coming from the global south and this means that we're going to have some challenges. It means that our, our leaders, both in the South and, and in, the, in, in the West or in the Northern countries, will certainly have some challenges to deal with. And more of us are on the move. You might notice that this picture is, is moving. <laughs> uh, and I love, I love the image here because it indicates the movement of um, flights around the planet as you'll see as the, um, if you can see it, uh, that as the time of the light and dark shade across the planet moves, you'll see the concentration uh, of, the, of the, the jets and the planes lighting up across Europe and then over the North America uh, on the eastern coast through to the west coast as it closes down over Asia. 
So more of us are interacting than ever before uh, in, in our history. We've never moved around the planet so much. Uh, and of course, because we are, this requires, uh, this will lead to lots of different challenges that we haven't faced before. And of course, these challenges uh, require both global and local solutions. It's also interesting to know that we're starting to concentrate, that we're moving to the city. So in 2008, for the first time ever, more than half the world's populations became concentrated in urban areas. We now have the super cities, the 20 million people in a city um, or more. You know, and it's estimated uh, by the UN Population Fund that by 2030, 5 billion of us will be living in towns and cities. And we used to be a population globally that was distributed more into the rural areas. So if we're coming together, we're getting younger, we're moving more, uh, <laughs> uh, and we're concentrating, then certainly our leaders and all of us will have some challenges to deal with. We also know so much more now today about what's happening in the world. We have a global media system where we're exposed to messages faster uh, and more graphically than we've ever seen them before. Uh, and we know that there are fewer media giants that are controlling more of what we see and read and hear, and in the same moment, there's also um, all the advantages of our, our internet and uh, the freedoms that that does offer people as well. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that we now have more electronic devices to connect us than there are, in fact, people on the planet. Uh, so there's no doubt at all that we're more connected and we know more about what's happening. It's also true that if we have a more sociological analysis that, or, or political, in fact, analysis, that some of us are, are consuming much, much more than other parts, other people in the world. And uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these graphs before, which effectively suggest that uh, if everyone was to live at the standard of living or live in the way that people in the US or the UK lived, uh, in fact, we'd need many more planets for everyone on the planet to actually live that way. Uh, if everyone lived the way they do in Malawi, as it's shown on this graph, um, then we wouldn't need quite so many. And we're starting to get some feedback about that. And I'm sure many of you will be uh, conscious of the, all of the uh, conversations around global warming and the various changes that the planet's going through. And it brings about questions for us and our leaders about, you know, how can there be a safe climate and habitat for everybody? How can there be clean water for all? These are the, you know, with the ownership of water and um, the various... Um, commodification of these natural resources, then certainly these are challenges that we're going to be dealing with. Will there be, or how can there be healthy food for everybody? We know that, um, you know, that there's about one and a half times as much food produced on the planet than what we actually need, but it's not distributed in a way where everybody has healthy, nourishing food. Can there be safe energy and transport for all as we move from coal-based power uh, into newer forms of, um, of energy? Uh, and of course, you know, can, can we realistically say that in countries where uh, there is still a development gap, um, that they shouldn't be using these coal-based energies? How do we grapple with questions like how can there be basic education for everybody? All the different Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations, one of the key ones is uh, universal education, uh, primary school education for everybody. How do we achieve that? Can, how can there be peace and security for everybody on the planet, no matter where they're from and what they're doing? Is that a good idea? Is that the idea that we should be pursuing? Again, challenges questions, issues for consideration uh, by our leaders and, in fact, by all of us. Can there be meaningful work for everybody in our various economic uh, upturns and downturns um, and unemployment 
you know, the issue of creating livelihood and, and meaningful work for everybody is also there as a challenge. And how do we navigate the future holding the complexity of this global view? How do we hold the idea that all of these parts, all of these different countries, all of these people with all these differences um, can progress in a way which is useful and and I guess you know in a way which is meaningful. So there are questions that our leaders need to look at from a more business orientated point of view. How will our businesses, economies and systems work globally? How will we learn to work with the changing powers in the global economy, the BRIC nation? How will we hold this global perspective while also recognising the diversity and value of individuals and cultures? Where do we find the value of the individual when we are trying to hold this global perspective? And of course, as a result, how do we balance the global and local interests? So it sort of begs the question, doesn't it, that, you know, what's our role in all this and what sort of leaders are we going to need for the future with this context that we face of a younger population concentrated in the global south with all sorts of challenges? What sort of leaders do you think we're going to need for the future? Uh, so this is when I ask you to think about just making some notes for yourself, um, prompted perhaps by these ideas and concepts. What do you feel leadership will mean in 2050? How will they define it? Just make some notes for yourself about your impressions or thoughts about what you feel leadership will mean. What will this concept mean? What will it mean to be a leader? What will it mean to grapple with some of these very complex, seemingly intractable problems? And what are the qualities that you think leaders will need in order to grapple with these many challenges? Just holding this view of the complexity that we've just discovered or talked about in this context, this global context. What qualities and values do you think that leaders will need by 2050? In another 30 years or so, another generation, what sort of leaders do we need to help us manage this? I'm always uh, very inspired by the young people that, um, that I work with uh, and also very inspired by the, the very senior leaders, the chief executives and directors and folk that, um, that I have the privilege to work with through my uh, work with TPC. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to learn from people who've been there and done that, uh, people who've inspired me and I guess who are my role models. So let's hear what some of those folk think. Jane Goodall, the famous biologist and uh, person who did so much work around primates. The greatest danger to our future is apathy. Mikhail Gorbachev. In our globalized and increasingly interconnected world, we must learn to listen, to hear and hear each other to ensure that change, which is inevitable, inevitable, works for the benefit of all. Thinking of others, Indira Gandhi, I suppose leadership at one time meant muscles, but today it means getting along with people. I like this one. Kofi Annan, former um, Secretary General of the United Nations. Whether our task is fighting poverty, stemming the spread of disease, or saving innocent lives from mass murder, we've seen that we cannot succeed without the leadership of the strong and the engagement of all. So there's something interesting around this last part of this quote, the engagement of all. 
Mother Teresa. Do not wait for leaders, do it alone, person to person. Be faithful in small things because it is in them that your strength lies. Again, moving more towards this idea of not waiting for the heroic leader, but actually moving more towards leadership being owned by, by everyone. And of course, Mahatma Gandhi, we must be the change we wish to see, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. But actually, it's around the ownership of the challenge uh, that leadership offers us. Robert Greenleaf wrote that good leaders must first become good servants. The only test of leadership is that someone actually follows. And it's the work of Greenleaf that I think provides us with a useful uh, point of reflection around the kind of leadership uh, which might be needed in this emerging global community that we have been discussing and talking about. So Greenleaf termed the phrase the servant leader. He's sort of credited as the person who really has put that forward. There are plenty of other people who've written about it. But it's interesting to think about what a servant leader is uh, and what the qualities of a servant leader might be. And I'm curious that as you reflect on that, about whether there's much synergy between what you wrote before uh, about the kind of leadership that you think might be needed in order to address the challenges that we mentioned that are emerging for us by 2050 and the kind of characteristics and qualities that you might expect to see in a servant leader. Greenleaf wrote that servant leadership begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. And I think there's a lot of baggage around this idea of service because uh, certainly in, in some parts of the world we think about it as uh, something which is slightly belittling or downplayed in some way. But service can be a great gift and in fact uh, one which brings with it a sense of purpose and direction, and a, a, a sense of making a contribution. So in Greenleaf's conception of servant leadership, it's the idea that people are inspired by their communities or by the people around them or the challenge which they're experiencing. And they're inspired to do something positive about it. They're inspired to serve. They're inspired to make a contribution. And this is exactly the kind of leaders um, that I've had the great privilege of working with uh, through my involvement in this organization WISE. So, you know, whether it's a, um, a child soldier who, or an ex-child soldier who is inspired to, to protect other young people in their community from actually having that same experience by setting up reintegration services to prevent them from becoming um, military, um, I guess, uh, mercenaries. Um, or whether it's someone who sees the pain and suffering of uh, people who are not educated, who sets up schools, or someone who might have um, you know, started a water project in their community rather than seeing people trek for hours every day uh, in order to fetch and carry water. It's that they feel inspired, that they want to do something positive, they want to make a contribution. And then that conscious choice in Greenleaf's conception actually brings one to the idea or to the aspiration to lead. So it's almost that the leadership comes from that genuine space or place of wanting to make a contribution. And it's almost that that in itself is what actually puts them to the leadership position. He goes on to write that the difference manifest itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. So the test of the servant leader is that they're actually serving their community, serving the people around them. The best test, and difficult to administer, is do those serve grow as persons? Do they grow while being served, becoming healthier and wiser and freer and more autonomous? more likely themselves to become servants to others. 
So Greenleaf's conception is this self-perpetuating positive cycle of making a contribution uh, and leading others in the process. And personally, I find that approach quite liberating and certainly a, a good approach that we might be able to consider to tackle some of these global challenges that we've mentioned before. Greenleaf, um, you can find out more about it on this website, greenleaf.org. Basically, he makes the, the observation that while traditional leadership generally involves the accumulation and exercise of power in more of a pyramid type model, the servant leader approach puts the needs of the others first. It's very much a bottom-up approach. Uh, and in fact, the thing which really stands out for me is the idea that the impulse to make a contribution is what drives uh, and actually encourages the commitment to leadership. And as I said before, the work that we do with these um, people that are attracted to this work of WISE is very much like that uh, in the sense that they are inspired to make a contribution and lead themselves before they actually lead other people. Greenleaf goes on to say that the characteristics of servant leaders are focusing on the needs of the people they lead, developing people to bring out their best, coaching them, encouraging self-expression, facilitating personal growth, and listening and building a sense of community. Uh, and the proposition that I'm offering is that, in fact, these are useful qualities to think about in any organization, uh, and certainly to address and counter some of those challenges that we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. It's also interesting to consider service, the concept of service, uh, and that, a, that service can be about making a contribution, and there's an opportunity that that may lead to leadership, uh, and that maybe a service-orientated approach can actually infuse our leadership, no matter what role or um, position we occupy in organizations or communities. But if we take this service-oriented approach, it can be seen as a call or a pull to express ourselves, a sense of purpose or destiny, a sense of direction or vocation, something that actually motivates us and drives to make a contribution, uh, which in turn puts us to positions where we lead. So holding this in the context that we spoke about before. And this is really a provocation to think about what's your role in all of this, in all of these challenges? I don't know how old you are or where you'll be at 2050. Some of us, like me, may not even be here. <laughs> uh, but in fact, what can we do until then uh, in order to make a contribution and potentially uh, embrace this idea of being a servant leader. So if we do accept the proposition that leadership is something that everyone has capacity for, what's the kind of leadership that you feel you're meant to express for yourself and also with others? I'm just going to invite you to take a moment just to make some notes about that. What's the kind of leadership that you feel you're meant to express for yourself and also with others? How you lead yourself and also how you lead others and make a contribution. And finally, if everyone actually does have the capacity for leadership, like I definitely believe they do, I just encourage you to really reflect and maybe even challenge you to think about what is it that calls you to make a positive contribution? When you look around you, when you see your community, when you see your organisation, when you see the folk that you live and work with every day, 
What is it that calls you to make a positive contribution? What are the unique qualities and gifts that you have that you could use to be a servant leader? So again, I'm just going to offer you a few moments to reflect and capture some of these thoughts. If we really believe that everyone has the capacity for leadership, and I believe they do, what is it that calls you to make a contribution? And what are the gifts and qualities that you have that might become manifest in a model of servant leadership that you might embody? So really that concludes this brief um, webinar on servant leadership from the global perspective. As with all of our work with TPC, we hold very much to the value of what we call closing the knowing doing gap. So I just invite you to think about one action that you feel you'd like to take as a result of this webinar. What's one thing that you'd be willing to commit to as a result of taking part in this webinar? It could be something around the topics that we talked about. It could be something that you're curious about, that you'd like to learn more about one of the concepts or some of the facts and figures, some of the context that we talked about globally. Or maybe it's one of those ideas about how you want to lead yourself, and how you want to lead others, and what kind of contribution you feel you might be able to make as a servant leader. So again, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. I hope you found it useful and interesting. Uh, and we really encourage you to stay tuned uh, and stay involved in the uh, Leadership Summit uh, and uh, encourage you to challenge yourself to really uh, reflect on and think about some of the concepts that we'll be covering. Thanks again for joining us and uh, we hope you enjoy uh, the next webinar in this series. Goodbye.